Hey there, folks. Welcome back. Good morning if you are in my time zone. Good day, good afternoon, good evening if you are elsewhere. And today we are talking about typography. So type is actually like an incredibly cool part of design. And it sounds like, I was going to say it sounds kind of nerdy, but really like all of this is kind of nerdy. Type can feel especially nerdy because it's like a little bit more technical in some ways and it feels um, just a little bit different, maybe less artsy in some ways, but it is incredibly powerful. It is highly communicative. You can make a really compelling design with like just type alone. If you had like no other elements on the page, it was, you know, no shapes, no pictures, no nothing, just type. You can create really cool stuff with like just type. It's also really intuitive, right? Because it's something that all of us have to interact with all the time, every day. Ever since we learned how to read, right? Like we're dealing with typography on the regular. There's no escaping it. Even when we don't think of it as being like design type or like artsy type, even when we're just like reading Slack messages or reading emails or the, the back of a box of cereal or something, like it's all it's all typography. It's all design. It all counts. And once you start kind of looking at those everyday things through this lens of like, this is also design. There were also design choices that went into this. This was something that somebody thought about and arranged specifically in this way and set this type in precisely this, this layout, this format, for it to be easy as possible for me to read it. Then it kind of like, like the design goggles kind of click on and you're like, oh, yeah. Wow, right? <laughs> and like, that can be like, you know, when we're writing documents with like word processing stuff, that can be when we're like leaving notes for people. Like we are, we're working with type and we're using typographic principles all the time, even when we're not aware of it. You know, if you ever like started a page of paper with like a big uh, all caps title, something like way bigger than everything else on the page, that's type right? Like you were using size, you were using like a contrast in the size of the words to draw attention where you wanted to go first. You do it without even thinking about it, especially now that we are all spending so much time on our phones, right? Like that's type all the time. That's all words. <laughs> There's so much that we're just interacting with constantly without even really thinking about the fact that it was a design. And because of that, a lot of us can really recognize when type is bad, right? Like the goal is pretty simple. We're supposed to be able to read it. If it's hard to read, it's not a good design. It feels simple, but of course doing it correctly is a little bit harder, right? So the question is as always to like flip that on its head and be like, okay, we know what doesn't work or we can tell when things don't work. So how can we create things that do work, that do look good, that are effective in communicating what we're thinking, that are communicating a feeling as well as just information. And much like color, which we've talked about on here before, type is broad, like it's really deep and there's a lot of things that we need to learn about it. There's some like vocabulary that we need to learn about it and some history that we need to learn about it before we can become really effective at using it. So that's really what we're going to focus on today. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of typography kind of as we know it today. And then we're also going to do like a little vocab lesson, pick up some like typography related and typesetting related words. And that will kind of give us the tools that we need to really take a deeper dive on this. Um, I almost said next week, but as we just talked about, we will be back next week. Next time, <laughs> then we'll have the tools and the language that we need to really dig into this. I think the language is really a huge part of really all of this design stuff, right? Is that once you know how to describe something and once you can communicate it to someone else without just being like, uh, you know, the thing, like you're already three quarters of the way there. So that's our plan for today. Hope you're interested. Hope you'll hang out. Feel free to drop questions in the chat as always as they occur to you. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to jump right in, right? <laughs> so typography, the way that we mostly think about it today, which is like 
setting uh, letters and words and characters by a machine, not necessarily like handwriting things or carving things or any of that. Um, that is technically part of typography. But most of the time when we're thinking about type, we're thinking about like keyboards, right? computers, and the mechanical setting of type. All of that kind of traces back to the invention of the printing press. So before the invention of the movable type printing press, type was mostly done via woodblock carving, right? Which was really effective for making lots of different copies of the same thing over and over again. You could like carve something out once and then make a bunch of prints. However, that was not super effective for changing the actual thing that you're printing. So when it comes to like, you know, you wanted to make a bunch of copies of a flyer or a pamphlet, great, woodblock carving worked pretty well. If you're looking to set like an entire book, not so much. Most of that was still being done by hand. Um, it was pretty limited. Movable type kind of revolutionized this approach by offering a full set of characters, like little character pieces that you could move around in order, set however you like, lock into place, do a printing of, and then take it all apart again and mix it up. Let me see if I can get some pictures on the screen because I think this makes more sense with some photos. So we're just gonna, let's see if it shares my screen as it should. Yes, excellent, cool. Sure. So let's take a look at, I'm gonna move type. Awesome, okay. So you can see here, there's a bunch of these little kind of metal pieces here. And they each have a single character on them and they can be repositioned and locked into place within this kind of frame and then printed. And so here's some more photos of various different types. Here's a good one of kind of each of the blocks in the, the drawer. And then, yeah, here's a good one of kind of the frame that they can be set into. Um, obviously there are like larger frames that you can use when you're setting a lot of type. But this is a pretty good example. You'll note that it's backwards as well because you have to, you know, print and then you peel it off and you get the reverse. It's really hard the first time you go to set type uh, and you have to do it all backwards. You're like, oh God. <laughs> but before you know it, you start to like read backwards and you don't even think about it. It's truly really wild actually. Anyway, <laughs> the very first kind of movable type systems that looked like this were actually found in China, closer to like 1088. Uh, and they used clay and wood instead of metal, just, you know, because of the time. But the Chinese language is really complex, right? There's like a whole bunch of different characters and a whole bunch of different ways that those could be communicated. And it was just almost too complex to be worth the effort here, right? So because of that, it never really caught on. It was, it didn't make anything that much easier than the woodblock carving that was already like super prolific there at the time. So it existed and some people tried it out, but it didn't really have like a aha moment the way that it would in 1440 in Germany, right? So let's take a look at that. Wittenberg printing press. Yeah, so here's a good example, right, of a printing press. And this is what the Gutenberg press looked like. This was one of the first, like, really effective um, printing presses. I tried to go with another word so I wouldn't repeat myself, but I couldn't. Um, this used a, care a system of metal character blocks and, of course, the much more limited Germanic language characters, which made it much, much easier to kind of take advantage of this method that would let you mix and match your characters all around, right? And this really started, like, the dawn of the printing revolution. You've probably heard the name Gutenberg, possibly in connection to like the Gutenberg Bible. That was the first like major book that was printed using this printing press system. Uh, you might have also heard it online in terms of like Project Gutenberg, right? Which is the free ebook distributor. That's, that's why, right? Because this idea of the printing press made this kind of information accessible to so many more people than ever before. Books used to be 
horrendously expensive because they each had to be written out and then like bound by hand, you know? And so it would take hours and hours and hours and hours <laughs> to create a full book. With this system, they could do it in a fraction of the time. This also allowed for more kind of disposable printing, if that makes sense. Um, things like flyers and newspapers and pamphlets and brochures and like you know, little things that weren't like a full book, you know, that you would keep on your shelf for years and years and years. It was just meant to be consumed and then thrown away. But that allowed the spread of ideas in a way that we had never seen before, right? And it was almost equivalent to like the idea of the internet in that so many more people now could get access to these kinds of thoughts. And it was so much easier to spread thoughts and ideas. You could share concepts in ways that you never could before. So suffice to say, the invention of the printing press and this idea of, of type was just a huge, 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 huge game changer, right? Oh, whew, lost my place there for a minute. <laughs> but for our purposes, this idea of the metal, the metal movable type, ooh, five times fast, that's a real uh, tongue twister. The idea of metal movable type is really important to us because this was the origin of the art of typesetting. This was the first time we were really looking at setting the same characters in the same way over and over again in like a reusable typeface in a font, you know, as opposed to just somebody's handwriting or somebody's carving. And so we had to create all of these terms. We had to create all of these rules and kind of concepts that we had never had to do before. And all of that is still very much in place. Like we have hung on to most of that language, to most of that approach to typesetting. That's all remained quite true and quite relevant. So as we talk about some of the design terms, some of the like language that we use, some of the things to be aware of with typography, it can be really helpful to remember this, this metal movable type printing system and where these terms kind of originate because that'll help them make a lot more sense. Hey, Bindo, glad you're here. Cheers. It's a morning for me, so I'm still like working my way through my coffee, but I'm a little jealous of uh, the fact that you're already in the afternoon. I'll get there. Mm. All right, so let's start with characters, right? So let's pull back up uh, some of these guys, right? So when we're talking about characters, we're talking about any single one element in a font, right? And that could be a letter, it could be a punctuation mark, it could be a number, you know, anything that you would set here that would be its own kind of single block of type that would be considered a character. And that's how this works, right? Is that you would see, right, here's another one that shows um, some letters and some numbers. Every punctuation mark, every piece of anything that you could possibly need to write a sentence had its own little tiny block. And each one of those is a character. To this day, obviously, we're not usually setting it in uh, type, like in metal type, although letterpress still very much exists. There's a huge community of people that are doing that mostly for art now. Um, obviously it's not like a requirement, but you might still get things like wedding invitations that have been actually pressed by hand, you know, or uh, big fancy announcements or invitations or like, it's very pretty. <laughs> like it, it's, there's something that's very, uh, I don't know, luxurious about it. Cause you can kind of see the actual imprint of where the press has pushed these metal pieces into the paper, it leaves a visible mark. And there's something about that that's really, just really pretty. So letterpress still exists for the most part. Um, we've moved over to setting things digitally and it's it's easier, you know, uh, less cleanup, <laughs> less mess. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, we have some questions in the chat. How are we still doing press on print when doing massive series? It really depends, um, is the, the real answer. Some places very much yes, uh, and there are still ways to do this kind of printing that have become easier. So, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of what the word is. There are now machines that can make basically like uh, pre-made pieces of plastic effectively that you can ink and then press. So you don't have to set each letter by hand anymore. You can 
make something on the computer and then use a machine to create a piece of like raised plastic and then use that to make printings. Um, so that very much still exists as kind of an in-between. What is that called? Oh gosh. We had one of those machines when I was in college and I used it quite a bit, but that was over a decade ago. So <laughs> I can't recall. Um, yeah, that's exactly it. Yep, make a single piece that you can compress it onto paper. Yes, I wish I could remember what those are called. So here's a fun story. When I was in college, we had one of those uh, machines that would make that piece, uh, that single piece. And ours created like some kind of a like plasticky thing. Um, but the way something involved in it involved like water, I had to like rinse it off. Um, and I was working on my project, made my little piece, took it, printed it, 100% forgot about the machine and all of the water inside it, left for days, <laughs> came back and the whole thing had like molded miserably. It was disgusting in there. And I had to scrub the whole thing out by hand, uh, because I, I, messed it up. Uh, unpleasant. Got in a lot of trouble. Had to scrub a lot of mold off a very expensive machine uh, and felt guilty for weeks. So there's a fun Catherine story for you. <laughs> uh, hey, Maybaum. Glad you're back. Glad I'm back. Glad you're back. Glad we're all here. Uh, yeah, I was actually, let me re-go through this because I said it right at the very beginning. But yeah, things have been like a little spotty here. I've been doing a lot of travel. Um, we've been having holidays. So we're on this week. Uh, I just got back from Dev Up in St. Louis, which was a blast. And that was why we were off last week. Unfortunately, we will also be off <laughs> for the next like three weeks after this. Because um, next Monday is uh, Juneteenth observed here in the U.S., then I will be at React Next in Tel Aviv, and then it's the 4th of July in the U.S. So, <laughs> uh, oh, are you going to the, ooh, the Caribbean next month? It took me a minute. There's a Caribbean dev conference that's happening in November, and that was my first thing was like, ooh, are you going? Are you going to Caribbean dev conf? Uh, but you must just be going to the Caribbean. That sounds way more fun. Oh. That's brutal. <laughs> As someone who's broken plenty of pieces of machinery, there's nothing worse than that feeling of realizing, like, I don't have to tell someone that I ruined this. <laughs> I wish I could remember that, the name of that machine. Um, we're just going to Google things to see if it shows up. That's, and then these are like the printing. These are the actual things. Oh, polymer plate. That was it. These. <laughs> yes. Will it show the inside? Yes. This is exactly the thing that I uh, very nearly ruined when I was in college. Because yeah, this inside part like rinses off the thing and I didn't drain the water properly. Polymer plates. I'm glad we solved that. Cause yeah, that's, ooh, I had a flashback just looking at this machine. <laughs> but yeah, it makes these kinds of things. So you can see, this is actually a really good example. These printing plates where you could set something uh, digitally and then it like creates it. It is almost kind of 3D printing-ish in a way. Um, but before that was like a thing. <laughs> so it kind of carves them, creates these raised pieces on this polymer plate, and then you can print using that. You can ink it and print with it just the same way that you would if you had set all of the metal pieces. But yeah, uh, I filled one of those with mold and then had to scrub it out by hand. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a there's a fun thing. <laughs> um, gosh, let's see. What were we talking about before we went down the rabbit hole of polymer plates? I'm glad you brought that up, though, because that is a good, like, in-between method of how letterpress is often done today. That's kind of a, you know, if you're not looking to set everything by hand. Jumping back over. Let's talk about typefaces, right? So 
font and typeface are words that often get used like interchangeably, you know, like they are the same thing, but they are not exactly. So here's something that you can use to become the most annoying person in your office. <laughs> a typeface is a collection of characters in a specific style. And you already know them because you use these like all the time, right? Like Times New Roman is a typeface. Futura, Helvetica, Calibri, all typefaces. A font, on the other hand, is a specific version of that typeface. So um, like Helvetica is a typeface, but Helvetica condensed is a font. Or like Times New Roman is a typeface, but Times New Roman bold is a font. Oftentimes we don't think of those things, especially like italics and bolding as being a whole new font. We think of it more as like an effect that's applied to a font, but that has a lot to do with how we are used to setting type now, right? Because if you're in like Microsoft Word or whatever, you just kind of highlight a word and you hit the bold button and it turns bold, like the end. But if you were setting things in these actual drawers of type, let's go back. We'll type. Yeah, so if you were setting things with these actual letters, you would have to go back and grab the drawer that has like just the bold font in it. And then you would set just that word in just the bold ones. And then you switch back, you know? Um, if you think about actually like each thing being in its own drawer of type, then that can maybe help you kind of think about the difference. Because you might have a whole set of, you know, Times New Roman drawers. You'd have one for every single font size. You know, you'd have a Times New Roman 12 point, you know, Times New Roman 14, 16, 18, whatever. And then each one of those would also probably have a bold and italic, uh, possibly like a condensed or, you know, whatever, if you had variations. So you might have a whole bookcase basically full of Times New Roman in various weights and sizes and configurations. And each one of those is a font, each one of those drawers. And the whole bookcase of everything Times New Roman, that's your typeface. Now, most fonts are gonna have like different widths for each individual character. And you can kind of see that in these. Let me see if I can find one that's really, here's the one that's really clear, right? So you can see that like this O is significantly wider than uh, like the apostrophe or the S or especially like the I, right? Those are variable widths. When you have a fixed width, a single width for every single character, that's called a monospace font. And you've almost definitely seen those because they're used in like every single code editor in existence, right? Commonly we see them with like this kind of uh, typewriter style look to them. All right, here's a really good example of a proportional versus monospaced font. And usually, yeah, we see them, they look kind of like this and they've got that like typewriter -y feel because typewriters use monospaced fonts almost exclusively, just the way that they functionally worked. But they don't have to be, right? So here's one that's a little bit more modern looking. Do, do, do. I'm trying to see if there are any others that don't have that like super typewriter -y look, but you get the idea. Um, these are nice to know about <laughs> because you'll want to use them differently for different things, right? Like monospace fonts are super popular in your code editor because they make it really, really easy to read punctuation and uh, numerical characters, especially. They also work really, really well for creating like consistent indents. If you've ever fought that when you're like, you indent something and then you like go to the next line and you indent and it doesn't look exactly like it doesn't line up exactly the same so because you're using like a proportional font and so every width is not always going to be exactly the same however it's something worth knowing when you're trying to choose a font right a lot of times we don't tend to go for a monospace because they don't look as good you know like the flip side of not having everything sized exactly uh, like to the width that makes the most sense is that you end up with kind of some weird gaps sometimes. And you've probably seen that as well when you're like coding that sometimes it looks like there are two spaces and there's really one or like feels kind of funky or things feel a little closer, or a little further away than maybe they should. You can read it really easily, but it's not necessarily like beautiful, you know? Part of design is kind of knowing 
when to make that trade off, I would say. We've talked a little bit about the difference between art and design with art being something where the form is the most important and the way that you choose to present it is more important than what it actually does or says. And then design being kind of the opposite where the function is king, right? So like whatever you're doing, it doesn't matter how gorgeous it is, how beautiful it is, if it's not communicating the message effectively. The difference between proportional and monospace fonts, I think is really in line with this. Sometimes you're gonna want a monospace, especially for things like numbers or inputs, because it makes things really, really easy to read. But it's not as beautiful most of the time. So you kind of gotta weigh your options and see what makes the most sense for the thing that you're doing right now. <laughs> kind of following up from that, the idea of kerning. Kerning is the amount of space between two characters. You can see here, this one's a really good example of kind of looking at kerning and the difference that kerning can make. This is especially common when you have letters that are wider on one end than the other. So like the A's and the V's here are a really good example because you're gonna look like you've got a lot of space here because they don't line up quite perfectly, right? Ideally, we just wanna like scooch them together so that they like kind of nest and slot in. And when you're changing this space, that's your kerning, right? There's a lot of places where this is worth doing. You can kind of see that here, right? So like, here's another good example of the A and the V. Like the I and the L make a lot of sense. This is the same amount of space that's in between each letter in this word, but it looks really good here and it looks really kind of clunky and difficult to read here. When we go in and kind of fine tune those spaces, we can make things a lot easier to read and we can make them feel a lot more cohesive. Uh, ooh, bar is not what I meant, but oh, bad because it suggested that, and I was really curious. Uh, some of these are probably going to be inappropriate, <laughs> but yeah, um, you can see obviously. Oh yeah, there is an XKCD about this, isn't there? Um, we got to check out the relevant XKCD. Yeah. This is true, so you're welcome. If you really hate someone, teach them to recognize bad kerning. That's what we're doing today. I thought I liked you guys, but maybe not. <laughs> because yeah, as soon as you start to see it and you see like how uncomfortably close these are and what a weird gap there is here, and like, you just wanna, just wanna fix it. You just wanna, you know, squish them together a little bit and make it make sense. <laughs> Once you are aware of it, you will see it everywhere because neglecting your kerning creates gaps in words where you didn't want them. People start to like accidentally separate a single word into two different words, uh, or everything kind of runs together and becomes really difficult and really weird to read, or it just looks kind of off like it does in this comic. <laughs> hey, Fuel, welcome back. Welcome everyone. It is nice to be on stream again. It's It has been a minute, and it will be another minute <laughs> before we're back, so I'm just really enjoying uh, enjoying this. This is nice. <laughs> All right. Tracking, on the other hand, is kind of like kerning, but it applies to the entirety of a word instead of just that one individual space. So we got tracking versus kerning. Let's see if we get, here's a good example. Right. So you can see here kerning, they're just adjusting spacing between a single uh, like set of letters. So here you can see it in the VA, right, in vast, whereas tracking applies the same amount of spacing between all the letters consistently. Unfortunately, when we are setting type with CSS, right, uh, we don't have a lot of control over the kerning. There's not a whole lot we can do right now. Um, hopefully one day, but right now, the best that we often have is tracking. And if you want to really specify your kerning, you can throw like a span <laughs> around like a couple of characters and edit with tracking. In CSS, it's called letter spacing, which I always thought was weird. Like why not just use the right typographic term, right? Like why call it two different things? That's just confusing. <laughs> so um, anyway, 
if you want to do any tracking or kerning in CSS, it's letter spacing. Uh, letter spacing. Yeah, and so you can see it here. In my shader coding, I do fonts as distance field and all kerning by hand. Oh. <laughs> no, uh, let's not keep inventing new terms for things that already exist. Uh, yeah. Why not reuse well established terms for other things? <sighs> yeah, uh, it would be great. I know that, like, right, there's the whole joke, right? Like, naming is the hardest thing in programming. Or, no, what's the, the joke is uh, there are two hard things in programming. Um, Oh, I can't remember what the first one is. I'm going to ruin the joke. Uh, it's something um, naming things and off by one errors. You're high. Yeah, great, great joke. Cache invalidation. Thank you. Ah, absolutely ruined that joke. It's naming cache invalidation and off by one errors. <laughs> Thank you, Fuel. <laughs> I'm going to give up on that and just move on to talking about letting. <laughs> so... Letting is the space that happens between lines of text. Look, this originally comes from the actual like lead strips that would be used when you are setting movable type. Let's see. I bet there's an example here back on this page. Where's that one? This guy. Does this have good examples of letting? No, these guys are just stacked right on top of each other. They're just going for it. <laughs> just, just. No spacing at all. Let's see. Let's see if we can find an example that actually has some letting. Struggle. Here's a little bit, although you can't see the lead strips as clearly because they're lower. You can see that there's very clearly spaces between the lines here. But each one of those, it's a very thin piece of lead that separates one line from another to give them a little bit of spacing. So you can see here that there is actual like gaps between the characters. And that's what letting is, right? It's that space. Um, in CSS, we call it line height because again, cannot name anything the same way. <laughs> But it's really, really handy because it can give you a little bit more breathing room between all of your uh, all of your sentences, right? So this is really good because we talked a little bit about white space before, right? With the idea that when you have places in your layout where there's nothing at all, where there's just empty white space, that can give people kind of a place to rest their eyes, to process what they've seen. It keeps the thing, it keeps the uh, design from feeling really overwhelming, right? Sometimes it can feel really hard to squeeze that white space in because it feels like everything you have is really important and you like can't, you know, push things around or make room for it. Letting is a really good way to sneak in some white space without feeling like you've got like actual huge amounts of blank space because it does make the whole thing feel a lot more open, you know, and you can kind of see that here. As this one points out, uh, you probably know this from like the idea of single spacing versus double spacing. If you were like writing essays or whatever, all of that is just kind of shorthand for the amount of letting that you're using. And when we're doing line height in CSS, we can specify, you know, exactly That's a nice little animation that they have on this. I wonder why some of them have it and some don't. Funky. Anyway, that's not what we're here to do. It's a nice way to be able to kind of spread things out and set kind of a comfortable amount of space. In general, you're gonna want uh, a line height that's a little bit more than the actual weight of your font, uh, like the actual size of your font, not weight, sorry. So you wanna be able to give like, you want slightly more space in between your lines than the height of the font itself, right? So if you have like, you know, a 15, 16 point font, then you probably want letting in like the low 20s. 
and that will make it feel kind of balanced. Um, when they start to get too close, it can feel really cramped. Whereas the one that, yeah, like this one to me feels like a little bit tight uh, and a little bit tricky to read. I would space that out. This on the other hand feels a little bit big. It's probably not what you would want unless like uh, maybe if you were going to set like a poem or something that you wanted to give that kind of big breathing room kind of airy feeling or maybe like a pull quote or something that you want to like stand out and be really visually different. But if you're setting like just a block of type, I'd probably err somewhere in here, right? Give a little bit of space, not too much, but enough for it to be readable um, and not feel like everything is kind of getting crushed into place. <laughs> Yes, Fuel points out uh, boilerplate is an old typesetting term as well. Smaller newspapers had boilerplates of filler content they used to fill out the newspaper with. So much of this, actually, like almost all of the terms that we use, setting aside CSS, which for whatever reason has decided to rename everything, the terms on the design side have stayed the same um, with almost no change at all, <laughs> despite going through this kind of like you know, digital revolution, quote unquote, going from letterpress to like polymer plate style stuff to like, you know, typewriters and computers and everything that we can do now. Most of these terms have stayed exactly the same um, and really persisted. And then, yeah, variable fonts are really nice. We'll talk about those in like a little, I want to get through as much of our like list of terms as I can, since we only have like 20 minutes left in our hour. But I do at one point, at some point, I really want to talk about variable fonts because they're super, super changing the typography game uh, on the UI side. So yes. <laughs> but to jump back in to try and like get through our, uh, our typography um, terms lesson. Next, we're going to talk about uh, widows, orphans, runts, and rivers. So widows. Doesn't sound like a typography term, but in fact, it is. All of these things, things that they have in common, is that they make your type a lot harder to read. Oh, this is actually not true. This would be considered a run. <laughs> there we go. This is a better graphic. <laughs> Let me see if I can get this bigger. Do do do. Open image in a new tab. There we go. There we go. <laughs> so a widow is when you have uh, a single line of text that gets separated from the rest of its paragraph by like a page break or more often sometimes in um, UI stuff with like a column wrap or like when the, the yeah, when something resizes, right? You're, the width of your text box changes and it changes where your line breaks are. Um, an orphan is kind of the reverse situation. Um, when a first line of text gets separated from the others, runts are the last little words that wrap to the next line, like all by themselves and create this like really scraggly, weird little line. And then rivers, this is a really weird, let me see if I can find a better example of a river. Rivers are when your word breaks, that's a better one, <laughs> line up over several different lines of text and they create like a weird gapping. Here's a really good example. Right, so you can see here, you've got this like line that goes all the way through the type and it can be really distracting. You know, and sometimes like this one looks like it was done kind of intentionally. This one, maybe not, <laughs> right? So like, this was almost certainly done intentionally. It's just too big, but it's a really good example of what a river is <laughs> and, and what it will look like and the ways in which it would be distracting, right? Because when you look at this page, the very first thing that you see is this weird kind of alignment of white space. All of this happens when like your type wraps or you haven't uh, connected things specifically. It makes things really, really hard to read. And as, uh, oh, I was gonna try and read your name about loud, but I can't press it. Hello near this. As Hello points out, <laughs> it can be really distracting, especially uh, for neurodivergent folks, where it is a huge distraction um, and something to focus on that's not 
the words itself, right? Um, all of these you can fix by adjusting either your tracking or your word wrapping or by putting like non-breaking spaces between the like a handful of words at the very beginning or the end of your type. So if you're seeing that this is happening often, and again, this is something especially to be aware of when you're doing um, like responsive stuff, right? So when you're like, you know, moving your browser window and seeing how all your type is reshifting, check and see if any of this stuff is kind of happening at any of, of your widths. And if it is, throw in like some non-breaking spaces, mix up your tracking, mix up your word spacing, mix up your wrapping, like see what you can do to kind of break this up a little bit so that you're not getting these kind of weird wraps. And again, it's one of those things we don't have perfect control over when we're setting type um, in a UI, the same way that we would if we were setting type for a book or something that would be printed exactly the same way at exactly the same dimensions every single time. It's something to be aware of and to try and mitigate, but I would not like keep yourself up at night over this, you know, like do your best, <laughs> be aware of it. Um, and if, you know, if someone tells you about it, you know, you know how to fix it. But also everything is variable online. Like things move and shift and readjust in ways that they never did when we were printing on paper. So we do what we can. <laughs> Last, I want to talk about the different kinds of hyphens, right? So you might have thought like a dash is a dash, right? Uh, not quite so. There are in fact three different kinds of dashes. There are hyphens, n dashes, and m dashes. And they're all meant to be used in different ways grammatically, at least in English. Um, and they all look slightly different. So let's pull up some pictures. Of dashes. Oh, that's a great graphic. I love when I just Google things and get exactly what I need. <laughs> yeah, feel take a snapshot of the text as a PNG and serve that to guarantee the layout. I had some art directors many moons ago who probably would have agreed with that. <laughs> I know, I know you're joking, and yet it pains me. You just like sent me hurtling back in time. No, no, no. Oh God, no. <laughs> okay, dashes. So your hyphen is your shortest one, right? And that's when you want to do like compound words, you know, things like front end uh, or one in a million or something, you know, you like run them all together. Um, your end dash, on the other hand, is meant for ranges, usually ranges of numbers, as it says here. Um, this also works if you are like writing out your numbers, you know, if it's like two dash three. Um, the end dash and the m dash are also typographic terms because those dashes are exactly the width of the m or the n characters of the font that you're using, right? So an end dash will always be the same width as like a lowercase n. And M dash will always be the same width as a lowercase m. So easy way to remember them. <laughs> Y'all are throwing some bad ideas in chat. It's cracking me up. <laughs> Use media queries and CSS content to swap out images. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, not accessible. Maybe with good alt text. I mean, if you had to, but you could just not embed the words in an image to begin with you could just you could just let it be live text <laughs> no i mean i think uh i think part of our job and it's becoming less so now i think but especially when all of this the internet and like you know brands on the internet was kind of new a lot of the job of a, a web designer or web developer is education and just like here's what we can do here's what we can't here's our current limitations Here's why this is the right idea. Here's why this won't work very well. And to kind of walk people through this. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's like the most fun and exciting part of our job is to like hold a lesson on, you know, whatever, uh, why we can't control exactly the way that words wrap at every single width of every single screen in existence. But when we take the time to do that, we can create designs and create websites and applications that are way better 
like just a, a far better user experience. <laughs> uh, <but> yes. <laughs> Jimmy Beck. Yeah. Oh, interesting. We got the uh, shortcut codes there. You can also, you I think you can get to all of them on your keyboard. Certainly you can do the regular dash and then the M dash um, with just like a, like a shift, right? Your N dash, maybe not. I'm trying to remember. A lot of uh, like typesetting programs now, right? Like if you're writing something in Word or like Google Docs or whatever, a lot of them know these rules and no matter what dash you put, it will convert it to be the, the right kind of dash. So if you're using software like that, it's really nice. You kind of don't have to sweat it. If you are writing the copy yourself, you know, like if you are making a website or whatever, you need to be aware of these so that you can make sure that you're getting the right one um, and that it shows up correctly, right? The M dash, which I don't think we've gotten to yet, um, is like a, a different thought, right? A break in a sentence. So anytime you have like, you know, this is what she said, like so. That would be where you would put an M dash. And generally, uh, you don't put a space on either side. That's a really common mistake. Um, and you kind of, I kind of think it looks better with a space on either side, but that's not technically grammatically correct. <laughs> so uh, something to be aware of. Are these rules universal or do they apply to English? Um, I know that the N dash when you're talking about a range of anything is in fact universal. I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure the hyphen is as well. If you're, yes. Okay. Yes. The first two are universal. I don't know about the M dash. I don't, I can't speak to that. Let me try to Google it. Um, dash rules grammar. Let's try, I'm going to pick like a random language. <laughs> ah, so sometimes yes um evidently the m dash is used more often so there you go it looks like yes i have not done any kind of a like general search all of this definitely changes in um, like Asian languages, right? Where like the whole approach to punctuation is slightly different because the whole approach to like characters is different. So don't take that as like, uh, d don't take my my answer as law. Look it up, <laughs> ask someone, ask a native speaker <laughs> of whatever language you're setting in. Um, but I think these are definitely true to English um, I think the first two are universal. I don't know about the M dash because that is more stylistic, I would say, um, than anything else. But. Hey, Sean, we are almost at the end of the episode today, but I'm glad that you joined. We've been talking about typography uh, and currently are talking about different kinds of uh, dashes and hyphenation. Sure. Uh, Hello says solid today when I was processing Ulysses <laughs> by James Joyce text an M dash I was searching instead of minus. Yeah. Yeah. Google Docs will kind of mangle quotes. There's a lot of that kind of stuff, right? If you're like copy and pasting where the computer will just kind of like guess or like make a best attempt. And there's a lot of things that look similar typographically and get like swapped, right? So the idea of like, um, I'm trying to think of a better term for this because I've only ever heard it as like smart quotes and dumb quotes and I don't like that. I think that's kind of ableist. Let's see if the internet has any better options. Smart quotes and straight quotes, that would be better. Curly quotes and straight quotes, all of those are better options than what I have learned. Yeah, we need to phase out <laughs> the word dumb in that way. Um, but anyway, ooh. Code quotes and human quotes. That's interesting. I like that. But yeah, so you'll see oftentimes there are two different kinds of quotation marks, right? And some are curved and some are straight, right? Um, and the curved ones obviously have to be used in a specific way, right? Because they frame the text that you're setting. And so there's a specific one that needs to go at the beginning. There's a specific one that needs to go at the end. 
the straight quotes are a little bit more flexible because it doesn't matter. Read like <laughs> there's no there's no change. Uh, and then of course quotations are different. Some um, some languages use the the like carrot style. This kind of thing. These guys. So it really depends. Um, I started off on that rant because we were talking about Google Docs and mangling things. And that's because there are lots of characters that look the same, but are not actually the same, right? And so like the quotes are a great example. The dashes are a great example. The idea of like, you know, uppercase O's versus zeros, um, you know, L's versus pipes. Like there's lots of characters that can look almost indistinguishable depending on the font that you're using. But you want to make sure that you're using the right one for a couple of reasons. First, uh, if someone is copying your stuff, right? Like if you're putting something on a website and someone copies and pastes it, you want it to be correct. You also want it to be accessible, right? And like, again, using the right characters is, is ideal. You don't ever want to be like, well, this looks better, but it's not technically correct. And so you use something that yeah, is not right. <laughs> that can be confusing if you're not actually visually taking in the page. And it's something that I think if you're not looking for, you can just kind of overlook, right? Like, especially this font example, these quotation marks don't look that different, right? Like the difference between the straight quotes and the curly quotes are not as different as like this example where it feels, right? Like these feel very drastic and these feel not so drastic. And it really is gonna come down to the style of which individual font that you're using and how things look and how things are coded and what's available, right? Because that's the other thing, not every single font that you use is gonna have every single character that you might need, especially if you're using like some random free font that you downloaded off the internet, you know? Um, that's gonna be the difference that you'll see, I would say most of the time between like using a font that uh, a type designer thoughtfully designed and created and using something someone created on the internet. Um, is kind of what what you'll get and how much is available. <laughs> yeah, great for variable amplification and dash and minus. Yeah, say it, so much that is it's gonna be the same. Uh, hello, Disco. Again, sorry to y'all that have joined almost right at the end. We've got like five minutes left before I jump off. So um, let me actually open it up to, to questions because we've been talking about type. We've been talking about all sorts of stuff. I always love when people throw things in the chat as we're talking so that we can like look it up. But if you had any like questions or thoughts or things that you hoped that I was going to talk about and I didn't, uh, throw them at me. Let's figure it out in the last like few minutes of this. Uh, and I'm going to close my 28 million open tabs. <laughs> but hopefully this was helpful. Hopefully it was a little educational. Hopefully at least you enjoyed that story about me ruining the polymer printmaker at my college. <laughs> and otherwise, uh, I will catch you guys on the other side. Have a good week, y'all. <laughs>